gentlemen, please welcome Karen Morgan. Karen Morgan. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad we got a duck blind right behind us. It's Southern night. We're going to be shooting in a little bit. Just look out behind y'all. We're going to be shooting way up there. How is everybody? Good. I'm so glad to be here back on Nantucket. I am a Southern girl. I was born and raised in Athens, Georgia. Go dogs! I went to college and graduated from the University of Georgia, and after that, I went to Atlanta to law school. So before I became a comedian, I was a trial attorney. <laughs> On my resume, this is a lateral move, so we're still working out. No, I am. I'm now. I'm glad we're all getting back out. We're traveling again. We're doing stuff. I, I was able to do some shows down south this spring and I went through the Atlanta airport and I ran into a friend of mine I hadn't seen since like high school. And we did that Southern girl thing where she was like, oh my God, how are you? I haven't seen you in so long. And then she said, how was y'all's pandemic? <laughs> like it was spring break or something. I was like, I don't know. Mine was fine. How was yours? No, my, t my pandemic was great. Um, I, am, I am married. I'm married to a Yankee. Um, my grandmother is still upset by this, even though she died a long time ago. I was raised in a household where the Civil War was called the War of Northern Aggression. No, but it's worked out fine. We're still married. We just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, 25 years. Thank you. Thanks. So 25 years, the traditional gift is supposed to be silver. I think the modern, more appropriate gift is just a ride home from your colonoscopy. That one's more useful, quite honestly, than silver. It really is. But I don't know that this man and I are going to make 25 more years. I'm not sure because I can't watch TV with him any longer. My husband is one of these people that will come in on a TV show and start asking questions. I hear a lot of people doing that. Asking questions. So my kids and I watched Game of Thrones. We watched all eight seasons, all 73 episodes for eight years. My husband watched zero. And then on that final series finale, we, we had special snacks and we're on the couch and we've waited years for this show. My husband fixes a drink and comes and sits down in his boxer shorts and says, what's this show? <laughs> what kind of game do they play? Are there teams? Where's the throne? Is there a king? Is there a queen? Who's that lady? Why is she so mad? Who's that guy? Why is he so small? <laughs> Are there dragons? Do the dragons fly? Do the dragons talk? And I'm like, yeah, the dragons talk. And they say, you need to get the hell out of this room right now. You need to go out of there. No, he's a good guy. So what I do when I want to watch TV and I don't want him to come in is I pick shows he didn't like, right? My favorite show to watch without him is called Say Yes to the Dress. <sighs> I love this show. If you haven't seen it, here's the plot. Women try on wedding dresses. That's it. <laughs> that is the whole show. Now, they have different locations. They've got one in New York, and they've got one in Atlanta, so it's like wedding dress CSI. So... So the one in Atlanta, in uh, New York is at this fancy place called Kleinfeld's. The one in Atlanta is at a place called Bridles by Lori. And it's run by this woman named Lori Allen, who opened her wedding dress store in 1980, 12 days after she graduated from college. 12 days after I graduated from college, I was still hungover, face down on the beach in Panama City, Florida. I didn't know what day it was, but I had a Born to Booze airbrush t-shirt on there. But she, Lori Allen was opening her store. She's still in business. It's, she has like the most popular wedding dress store in the South. Here's why she's so successful. She knows her industry. She's a smart lady. Most of all, she knows how to be nice to people that we would just smack right in the face. <laughs> right in the face. So here's how a typical episode works. The bride comes in. Let's call her Brittany. Okay. Brittany comes in and she's got her mama and her grandmama and her aunt and two of her 18 bridesmaids, okay? And they come in and then the consultant greets them at the door and says, well, what are you thinking today? And Brittany says, well, I'm thinking I want a mermaid fit and flare and my budget's $37.25. <laughs> 
and this is the first opportunity. Brittany should be smacked right in the face. But they don't do it. So Brittany tries on a bunch of dresses and her friends and family are all mean to her about all of them. She finally finds one that she loves and she comes out. And she's just smiling. She's so happy. And then her mama goes, oh, no, that's too bosomy. You may not wear that. And her aunt goes, yeah, it's kind of revealing. And then her grandmother says, you look like a whore. And um, <laughs> this makes Brittany sad. And she goes back and she's crying. And this is when Lori Allen just swoops into action. And she has a catchphrase. She says, I'm going to jack her up. That's her catchphrase. She says this about the brides. I'm going to jack her up. And that, that means she's going to give Brittany wedding hair and wedding jewelry and a veil to wear and a bouquet to hold. Then Brittany comes back out and then, oh, her mama starts crying and the aunt is crying. The bridesmaids are crying because they all know that this is the dress, right? And then her grandmother says, you know, it looks a lot less skanky when you put a veil on there with it. And then her credit card gets swiped for $5,000 and everybody's happy. And then they go to Panama City and get Born to Booze t-shirts for the bachelorette party. The other, the other show I like to watch, my husband will not watch this one with me. It's called Botched. Ooh. It is a show about plastic surgery gone wrong. <laughs> So what happens is these two plastic surgeons, and they have to fix pla bad plastic surgery that these people have gotten. Usually what happens is they've gone to some third world country, right, to, to save money on plastic surgery, which is so smart. So smart. So there was a woman on there, and she had gone to Tijuana to get butt implants. And she came back, and she's on the show, and her ass is right here behind her knees, like right here right here. And she says, I don't even know what's in my butt at this point. And I was like, I'm, you know what? You paid $17 for butt implants. I'm thinking sheetrock mud, <laughs> aquarium sand, maybe some gravy. I don't know. You're stupid. You deserve your ass to be on the floor. You deserve that lady. So I am now afraid I'm never getting plastic surgery because I don't want to go on botched. Um, but I have, my friends are trying to talk me into doing Botox. I'm 58 this year. My friends are doing it. And I'm like, I think I might do that because here's why. I have eaten lukewarm chicken salad out behind the Baptist church on a sunny Sunday afternoon out of a Tupperware dish that had no ice on it. Um, what I'm telling you is I'm not afraid of a little botulism squirted right into my face. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm gonna do that one. Um, I am a, a Southern girl. My favorite restaurant in the entire world, and this is—I'm not joking. This is very serious. It's called a Waffle House. I live in Maine. It's the one thing that I miss. It's the biggest thing I miss is we don't have a Waffle House. If you've never been, you can go to Waffle House and be the drunkest, most illiterate person on planet Earth, and still manage to order your breakfast. Um, so. Usually when I'm traveling, if there's a Waffle House where I'm going, and when my plane lands, my rental car goes right to the Waffle House. I'm straight there. So I, and I went to Charleston, South Carolina not too long ago. My plane landed. I went to Waffle House, and it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was lovely. There was nobody in there. It wasn't crowded. We're, I'm playing the Waffle House song on the jukebox. It was nice. And then my server came over, and she was dropping all the stuff. She was dropping the silverware and the syrup, and she was all fidgety. She's like, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. My doctor has just changed my Adderall prescription and it's kind of making me kind of fidgety. And then she said, but there's a bonus side effect. I am now psychic. <laughs> and I was just happy to be at that Waffle House that day. And then she said to me, well, so how do you want your hash browns? And I said, I don't know. How do I want my hash browns? She was wrong. Um, so I see we have lots of generations here tonight, and I'm glad to see everybody. I'm glad we're all getting back out together. Um, on social media and the news, we see that the generations are fuss fussing amongst each other. They're squabbling. So if you don't know which one you're in or who you're supposed to be mad at, I'm going to help you all out. So our oldest generation right now living is the silent generation. These people were born between the 1920s and 1940s. Um, these are the people that are still afraid of microwave ovens. <laughs> and cook with lard. These are my in-laws. My in-laws are lovely people, lovely people, 
They've been married 63 years, and apparently if you've been married that long, you no longer have the ability to hear the sound of the other person's voice. <laughs> because I go to their house and they both talk at me at the same exact time. So the next generation down are the baby boomers. Any baby boomers here tonight? Woo, baby boomers, we're all good. Baby boomers, my mom's is an older baby boomers. My mom's generation perfected smoking, yay. They smoked at home, they smoked at church, they smoked in the hospital, that's what they did. They also smoked with their kids in the car with the windows tied, really tied up. Now, for some reason, the baby boomers hate millennials. To be fair, everybody hates millennials. We all hate them. It's because I think they invented avocado toast. Right? And the word artisanal. Why? And, but don't be upset. If you're here and you're a millennial, don't be upset. It's not your fault. You're douchey. It's not your fault. Your, Jar Jar, your Star Wars has Jar Jar Binks in it, and you're never going to come back from that. Now, the generation below millennials is Gen Z. These are my children. Good luck, America. <laughs> Gen Z doesn't know how to write a check. They don't know how to read cursive. They don't know how to address an envelope. They don't know how to read a paper map. They can't get anywhere if there's not a map on their phone. Uh, so I'm just telling y'all this. If Gen Z takes over the world, it's going to be real easy to get it back. <laughs> We're just going to write our battle plans in cursive on a piece of paper. <laughs> and then mail it to ourselves in envelopes. <laughs> did I forget anybody? Any generations? Did I forget? Gen X, Gen X thank you. Are you Gen X? Yeah. Excellent. I, exactly. And that is my point. I am the first year of Gen X. I did not forget Gen X, but everybody does. CBS News forgot us last year. CBS News did an entire story on all the generations. They did silent generation boomers, and then they skipped over 65 million of us Jam Bradys and went to the millennials and the post millennials. But here's all you need to know about us Gen Xers. We don't care. We don't care. In fact, we kind of like it. We like it that you left us off your little list. We're like the secret dive bar that only the locals go to. We don't advertise, but we're never going out of business, right? We are the latchkey kids that were raised by the divorced boomer parents. We sat in the way, way back seat of our mom's station wagon, just rear facing at the people behind us. Just waving just waving. And this is boomers too, a little bit. None of us use sunscreen. We just laid out on giant sheets of aluminum foil with baby oil and iodine. We sprayed sun in, in our hair. We turned it orange. We don't care. We don't care. Nobody wore a seatbelt. Not even in the front seat. If your mom's arm wasn't strong enough, you deserve to go through the windshield. We didn't have helicopter parents. In fact, we had the opposite of helicopter parents. We had Home Depot parents, where you think there should be someone in the store there that can help you. Right? But no one's around. You're on your own. This is Home Depot. Do you need a skill saw? There's only one left, and it's way up there on that shelf. Grab yourself a ladder, my friend, and start climbing up there. And don't pull it over and cut your arm off, because nobody's going to take it to the hospital. In fact, it's going to be your fault that you got hurt. Here's what we get. Suck it up. Blow on it. Rub some dirt on it. Walk it off. Don't bleed in the house. Welcome to Home Depot. <laughs> Nobody cared if we were bored. Nobody cared what our grades were. Nobody cared that we were eating lunch out of a lunchbox that was filled with rust. <laughs> Did y'all have a rusty Scooby-Doo lunchbox too? Yeah. And we're all still here, right? We're never going out of business. <laughs> Nobody came to our athletic practices. 
Nobody cared that we were being pummeled in the face by real red rubber dodgeballs. The real red, you could smell the rubber coming at you. And then it went twang when it hit you in the face and left a crosshatch print right on your forehead. And now they have foam ones for the little babies that can't play real dodgeball. Nobody came to the athletic practices and no one brought sliced oranges. <laughs> Certainly no one was arranging a play date for us. Here's how my mom arranged a play date. At 8 o'clock in the morning, my mom would say, y'all, go outside and play. Boom, lock the door. That was it. We were outside all day. We didn't have anything to eat. We didn't have anything to drink. We didn't have a juice box or any goldfish crackers. If we were thirsty, where would we drink out of? Hose. Hose Drinkers Unite. And what were we doing outside? We were trying to kill each other. We had rock fights. We had dirt clawed fights. We had green pine cone fights. And we had BB gun fights. We were shooting each other in the yard on purpose with BB guns and our parents knew it and no one cared. No one cared. We did have some rules, right? There were some rules like three pumps max. If you were good, you could get four in and nobody saw you. No intentional headshots, right? And on holidays, we ramped up to bottle rocket wars and Roman candle wars. And all my dad ever said was, don't shoot each other directly in the face. <laughs> that was it. Sometimes my mom would actually give us some money and she would say, y'all, you go down, get out of here, go to the candy store. And she would give us money to go to the candy store. She wouldn't let us back in the house. She would like slide it under the, the screen door. And she said, I'm going to give you this money to get candy if you bring me back some cigarettes. <laughs> yes. So she is inside watching Dark Shadows, and we leave on our own. Yeah, she, we weren't allowed to watch Dark Shadows. Barnabas Collins would get you. So we would leave, we'd take our money, and we'd go down to the candy store, we'd get my mom's. Well, first of all, they, you could get them for a while. Like, I was nine years old, and I would go in the store, and I'd say, um, I'd like to have a carton of Merit Menthol 100 Ultra Lights, please. And they would sell them to me. And then you had to have a note. Your mom, my mom would write a note that would say, Dear store, please sell my child cigarettes. Love, mom. Right? So we'd go down there and we'd buy our candy and we'd buy our mom's real cigarettes and we would buy our candy cigarettes, which were one of the best parts of growing up in the 70s because they don't have them now, which is super sad. And if y'all remember, they came in two kinds. There was the hard white stick that was just like a stick of sugar with red on the end because someone painted fire on there for us to eat. And then there was the bubblegum kind, right? And you could blow out, you just pull it out of that package and we'd wear our candy jewelry. And stand out in front of the Handy Andy store and just smoke our candy cigarettes. Doing what we had to do to survive the main streets of Athens, Georgia. Until the street light came on, and everybody knows that's time to go home. Thank you all so much for coming and supporting the Comedy Festival. Have a great night, everybody. Yeah.